Notice in the background to my left, we have a beautiful lady. We're into the missionary journeys of Paul now. And on these journeys, he's going to meet some outstanding women of God. Uh, there will be uh, Priscilla, who's a great teacher and worker for the Lord. Not only a good wife, but able to teach, even uh, help teach a preacher. And we also will meet Lydia, another great lady, evidently a very successful business lady and very wealthy and a strong supporter of missionary work. Uh, all through the Bible, women have played such a very, very important part. Some people have you believe today that Christianity in the Bible uh, puts woman down and, and, and keeps her in a lesser place. But from the time that even two great books of the Old Testament were named after women, uh, Esther and Ruth uh, and many others, God has always loved and used women in his work. This little lady was uh, molded from clay in the, the, on the island of Jamaica. And uh, in two of my missionary journeys there, I, last one I obtained this, and uh, very beautiful. Uh, some think uh, in their society that they want to be more like a, the Western world, and they uh, don't use things on their head anymore. But I think that's a great ability and great talent. We Americans are always dropping things, trying to hold things, and uh, open the door and this type of thing. And they learn to use their heads. It makes them stand very erect and very beautifully. And their hands are free. And so this little lady has bananas and pineapple and pawpaw and maybe some palm fruit and uh, coconuts and, and so forth as she goes from door to door to sell her wares. So I just thought this would be a good time since we'll be approaching the missionary journeys where Paul will meet some outstanding women. We would show you some of the type of great women we meet as we go around the world in teaching the gospel. We're in the uh, 13th chapter, and uh, we're looking at a verse that has caused great difficulty with some people, partly because it's not always been translated the most accurate way, and others because people had a a preconceived idea before they ever read that. And that is verse 48. And as the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And some have said that this teaches that God foreordained, that God predestined that certain people would be saved, certain people would be lost. And if you're in one or the other group you can't do anything about, it, you can't change. And, and this ordaining takes place even before the believing takes place. Uh, if this teaches this, of course, it would be it would cause some strange statements in this uh, episode here. Back in verse 40, uh, Paul in preaching says, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken by the prophets. And then he talks about prophets predicting that certain people would not believe. Now, Paul is saying, don't, don't let yourself get in a position where you're fulfilling that prophecy. If it was prophesied, it certainly was going to come true as of some people, but people themselves decide whether they're going to be the fulfillment of that prophecy. Otherwise, it would make no sense at all for Paul to say, beware. Beware means be careful. Uh, be sure you don't get into this category of people. Now, if these people are already predestined by God to be lost, to be saved, Paul was wasting his breath to say beware. They wouldn't, there wasn't any way they could beware. Uh, they, they would just have to accept whatever is their destiny. So if that is a correct interpretation of this verse, it would... Uh, it would cause other verses not to make any sense. Uh, the, the view that I'm speaking of is often called Calvinism. Another thing that would be wrong with this text, if this is what it's teaching, is that Calvinism teaches that the elect can never really know for certain that they are the elect. Uh, you may be saved or unsaved, but you won't ever know until Judgment Day. You just hope that you're one of the elect. But here, Luke is describing two categories of people. He makes it pretty clear that he knows which ones are which, and that they can even know which ones they are and know whether or not they're fulfilling this prophecy. The problem is caused by the fact that this is not the ordinary Greek word that is translated predestined or foreordained. Uh, and that's why I say it's probably not the best translation. This word, particular word here where it says that as many as were ordained to eternal life believed uh, is only used eight times in the New Testament. And only one other time is it used to translated the word ordained. In Romans 13 and 3, in speaking of government of power, it says the powers that be are ordained of God. That is, they are set in order. They are arranged. They were uh, put that way according to God's will. But notice that in that place, it says they were ordained of God. One of the first things we want to notice here, this does not say, although many people imply that. Notice it doesn't read this way. 
as many as were ordained of God to eternal life believed. It doesn't say how they got in the right order, how they got things lined up correctly. It just says they did. But it's significant that the word of God or by God is not here like it is uh, ordained of God in Romans 13 and 1. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 34, Paul uses this same word in talking about what he intends to do when he comes to Corinth. And this shows this can be an act of man. This can be something that man does. In 1 Corinthians 11, 34, it's translated, the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul says, when I get there, I'm going to line things out in a certain way. I will organize. I will set things in a proper uh, procedure. Uh, so really the word more often is translated to set in order or to place in a certain order, to get priorities and values like they ought to be. In Matthew 28, 16, it's spoken of as uh, to appoint a particular place for something. Uh, in Acts 22, verse 10, we'll see later, it's used to appoint something that, uh, someone to do something. And then um, in Acts 28, verse 23, it's used to talk about a day being set aside or lined out. Are, are set for something to happen. But probably the best translation of the word that would serve us here is in Acts 15, which we're coming to shortly, uh, where they are uh, in Antioch trying to figure out what to do about this controversy that's risen about circumcision, whether or not Gentiles who have been baptized in the church must be circumcised in order to be saved. And they discuss that, and they're trying to decide what to do, and who's causing the confusion, and there's uh, questions and answers. But finally, it comes to a conclusion, conclusion, and they, they, they get everything lined out in order and decide exactly the steps they're going to take. And in verse 2 of chapter 15, it says, they determined, they determined, and it means they made up their mind. So this can refer to a attitude or a mindset or the way one arranges his plans in his mind for what he wants to do. And that really is the meaning here, and we're going to show that in just a moment in another way. But so the, 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 the better translation, and many of you will be studying out of uh, English translations that will translate it in a better way. And you say, well, okay, why are we wasting all this time? Because uh, we hope you will be studying with many other people. And many times when you study in their home, uh, they will be using the American Standard or the King James or some translation that will use the word uh, foreordained. And uh, usually people trust their own Bible more than they do yours or mine. I don't, uh, don't know all the psychology back of that, but that's just true. So in home studies, you will find that you will make uh, progress faster if you will uh, sit down at the kitchen table with a tablet and pen, pencil, and make notes, and then uh, look things up in their own Bible. They, you know, they trust that Bible. And if their Bible is one that says this, then you've got to have some explanation they can understand, not just say, well, let's read my Bible instead. But a more correct reading would be as many as we're determined to go to heaven. We already said that, that the word can be translated that way, and even is by uh, the American Standard in 15 and 2. Or you could say as many ha had got their, uh, we'd say in modern slang, got their head screwed on right. As many who had their values in the right order, who had their priorities right. Uh, a, a more educated use of the word would be uh, as many as were inclined towards religion and towards God and towards heaven. Or some translations say, as many as were disposed towards eternal life. That is, that's where their mind was and not on the things of this world like these other people. So that, that will help clear it up a great deal. But now suppose that you're studying with someone who really is not well informed about language. You know, they may have a higher IQ than mine or yours, but they simply do not uh, understand language. And their education may be very limited. Uh, what is a common sense way, easy way? Well, it's simply to look at these categories of people. And right at the end of the last tape, you remember, I turned my Bible around and Eric focused in, and you could see where I'd underlined uh, the characteristics of one of these groups. And then uh, I took a different color pen and underlined the characteristics of the other group. But uh, looking back now at, at these two groups of people, and you can see which ones had determined to go to heaven. And this means that one group didn't care. And we'll read a phrase to show that. One group was saying, we'll do anything in the world that you tell us to do. We can tell by your miracles that you are men of God and you're God's messengers and whatever you tell us. If you tell us to stick our head in the fire, we're going to do it. We want to go to heaven so badly. That's our number one priority. We've got our, our, our things set in order. We know the right values. And so just tell us what it is God wants us to do. Well, when a man has that attitude, you know before you ever tell him that uh, what's going to happen. He's predetermined 
or foreordain himself by his very attitude what he will be. And we'll look at another simple scripture in a moment to show that that is a principle. But looking now at these underlining, we kind of skipped this as far as reading it, but we just showed it to you underlined. Uh, for instance, here is a, the group of people that uh, had not got their minds set right and did not have their values right. Uh, they, uh, it says in verse 45, they were filled with jealousy. They contradicted the things that were spoken by Paul. They blasphemed. That's three things they did that are wrong. A man full of jealousy who has no respect for the Word of God blaspheme. He's not, he, he's already predetermined uh, what that sermon is going to do for him. He's closed his mind. And then uh, down in verse 46, Paul says, you thrust the Word from you. And he said, you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. That's a strange way to state it. But Paul is saying, you don't realize your own value. And you're, it's, it's if you've decided you're not worth saving. You've made the decision. We haven't. Because they were concerned about politics and power and influence and who's going to be the big man in the group and this type of thing rather than, you know, where am I going to spend eternity? And Paul says, when you put earthly things first, you're really saying you're judging yourselves uh, not to be worthy of eternal life. Then... Uh, Further on down uh, in verses uh, 50, uh, the chief men of the city stirred up a persecution against Paul. They stirred up other people. They caused Paul and Barbara to be persecuted and even cast them out of their borders. Now, that was a characteristic of the people that we'll see later represented poor soil. And by their very attitude towards the truth, they had predetermined or, or foreordained uh, whether or not they were going to believe. It wasn't a matter of what Paul said. It didn't matter what he said. They already made their mind that they were against it. But then listen to the characteristics of these other people. Uh, beginning in verse 42. They besought that these words might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Here are people that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, as Jesus says, and he says they'll be filled. Down in verse 43, they followed Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas urged them to continue in the grace or favor of God they were people already doing everything they knew that God had said. They just didn't know enough. They didn't know about all about Jesus Christ being his crucified son and resurrected son. But as much as God's grace had revealed at this time, they were following it. They were already in the, going in the right way. They were not saved yet, but they were going in the right way. They had a penitent heart. And then in verse 44, uh, they gathered together to hear the word of God. Uh, and then down in verse 48, they were glad and they glorified the word of God. So here are people that by their very attitude you know what's going to be the outcome. So the real simple meaning of the verse is, yes, it, it was foreordained that they were going to believe. They were ordained before they believed, but the thing that ordained them or predetermined was that they had an open mind and, and a good spirit and a kind heart. They were truth seekers. And uh, when, when you find people like that, and no matter who it is, it has the truth. If we have truth and it's credible, we can prove it from the Word of God, or as they did by miracles, and you know those people are going to obey the gospel. Uh, I'm, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, and yet I've seen times when I could almost with certainty say what was going to happen, particularly living in other countries. I've had uh, people of lesser education come and say, Mr. Underwood, I've been studying with you and heard you preach, and uh, I know your family, and I believe you're the kind of man that would tell me the truth. I've been studying the Bible. I've been visiting different religious groups, and uh, I, I'm take notes and I go study and, and what I'm hearing doesn't uh, agree with what I, I find in the Bible and I'm confused. But I believe that you're an honest man, you will tell me the truth. And if you can show me in the Bible what God wants me to do, I promise you I'll do it. I don't want to be lost and I feel like I'm lost. Well, now when a man comes with that attitude and he's honest, he's not trying to con me just to get a job or uh, court me for some other reason. When a man says that to me honestly, before I open my Bible, I can tell you what's going to happen to that man. Unless I lose my mind and forget the Scripture. Uh, I'm going to take the Bible and open it. I'm going to show him clearly that the Bible teaches he needs to hear the Word of God. He needs to believe it. He needs to repent of his sins. He needs to confess his faith in Jesus and be buried with the Lord in baptism. And though I said I'm not a prophet or son of a prophet, I will say in cases like that in my own heart, this man is going to be in the baptistry before 24 hours. You know, if we have that much time to study, or maybe at least within the week. Well, why do I say that? Because that man, by his very attitude, is probably, has already foreordained what's going to happen. He said, I believe the Bible. I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm lost. Please show me. And I know that I can show him. And so before I ever say a word, that situation is predetermined. And that's exactly what happened here. 
that the fact that this is a word that we associate with predestination and foreordination, I can't, I, it's what throws us off. Actually, the teaching here is an old, old principle, and uh, because it's a little bit, uh, stated a little bit strangely, we don't quite catch it at the moment. But this is exactly the same teaching that takes place in Luke, the 8th chapter. You remember in Luke, the 8th chapter, where Jesus is teaching about the nature of the kingdom and the, the word of God, and he says the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, and then he talks about his, uh, preaching or teaching is like a man going forth to sow. And you remember the four kinds of soil. He said a, a man went forward and sowed seed, and the first seed uh, fell on the wayside and was trodden under foot of men, and birds came and ate it. And then he said the second seed that was sown, or some of the seed that was sown, uh, was sown on rock, and it withered away. And then uh, the third kind of ground was the thorny ground, and uh, the seed was sown there, and the thorns came up and choked it out. And then uh, in the last place was the good ground, uh, and there it grew and bore fruit and, uh, and had the, the result of what seed's supposed to have. Now, they, they didn't fully understand. They said, Lord, what are you talking about? Explain that a little bit more thoroughly to us. And notice that in all cases, it's the sower and the same kind of seed. So the problem here is not the sower and it's not the seed. And yet, before that seed is ever sown, it's already predetermined what's going to happen. Now, we can see rock and we can see thorns, but we can't see into the hearts of men. And therefore, we don't always know what kind of ground that uh, we're sowing seed upon. There might come a time when we learn that and we may have to dust off our feet and not cast our pearls for swine, so to speak. But many times at first we don't know that. So Jesus explained to him. He said the wayside uh, soil that was trodden underfoot where the seed was trodden underfoot and birds came, he said that's like people that hear and they hear the, the word, uh, they, they believe, even not only hear but believe, but the devil comes and snatches it away. Now that's exactly what happens here. They hear the word, and I'm not even sure they even begin to believe it. But they begin to fulfill this prophecy where it says uh, they would not believe. And they were that kind of soul. And then he says the rocky soul is, uh, is the one that taketh with joy the, the word, the seed. And the withering away represents uh, a man that hears and, and he becomes a Christian. But temptation, thorns represent temptation. And they come and destroy him, pull him away, and he, he does not grow, does not mature and the seed cannot accomplish what its purpose is. The third soil was a thorny soil, and that's a person who, who hears and accepts it joyfully, and he's glad, but uh, he goes out, and he says the thorns choked it, and he says pleasure, and uh, the cares of this, of this world, uh, riches, uh, swallow up and crowd out. It might be things that are not entirely wrong with themselves, but uh, we get our priorities all wrong, and that's what some of these people were doing, and that crowds it out. And then he talks about the good ground, which is uh, good and honest hearts, Jesus says, and that will grow and bear fruit. Now, I know I took maybe longer than I should to be over here in Luke 8 and we're studying Acts, but what Jesus described is exactly what Paul and Barnabas are experiencing. That's the very thing. They came in, and maybe they were, you know, all kinds of soil here. At least we see two very prominent. Here's the first one where the, the uh, devil snatches it away. And then there's the second one here that is a very good and honest soul, the second group of people. So many times uh, what happens when the gospel is preached is, is determined not by the ability of the preacher or his orator or his uh, amount of scripture he knows or how well organized it is. Many times regardless of whether he's good or bad, efficient or poor or whatever, it's already predetermined by the kind of soil that is there. So this is a, a great lesson for us and one that we need to remember in terms of the kinds of people that uh, are preached to. Now looking then at... Uh, the closing of the chapter, um, the Jews urged on the devout women of Alamo State and the chief men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and cast them out of their borders. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Um, starting now in chapter 14, the second chapter of the first missionary journey. And it came to pass in Iconium that they entered together in the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and Greeks, believed. But the Jews that were disobedient stirred up the souls of the Gentiles and made them evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, they tarried there. Now, here's we've talked before about sometimes uh, to save their lives and continue their good work, they had to leave. They had to escape. They had to go by night. 
There were other times when they were right in the middle of a work they could not leave, that risking their life was not too great a price to pay to, to get the uh, kingdom established there. So here's a case where they stayed. Long time, therefore, they tarried. Usually when that term is used, it uh, means several months. And we'll see this term used again. Uh, but they did what we'd call local work, I guess, here. They're evangelists, but now they stay and, and ground them in the truth. Long time, therefore, they tarried there, speaking boldly in the Lord. They had to be bold to do it under the th uh, threat of death. Who bear witness unto the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. We mentioned before that uh, the view that some have that the apostles had this power and they could just at any moment at a snap of the finger display it and use it uh, is a mistaken idea. They did have miraculous powers, but it still was under the control of God. And the apostles often point this out, that this power you see in action here is through our hands, but it comes from Jesus. And there were times evidently when the Lord did not grant that power, even though they were apostles. We already mentioned uh, the young man that was with Paul that nearly died, that Paul did not heal. There was a case of Paul himself who was around other apostles quite often, and yet uh, there was no removal of his thorn in the flesh that he prayed to the Lord three times about. So th this verse points that out. Uh, God granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was made an onset, both of the Gentiles and of the Jews with their rulers, to treat them shamefully and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled unto the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the region round about. And there they preached the gospel. They became traveling evangelists. Uh, they, it was centered around three cities, but even the region round about. They wanted everyone to hear the gospel. And that's a, it, it's all right for us to settle in a city and concentrate on the city, but we always ought to be aware of the region round about. One of the questions we ask our graduates at International Bible College as they go to leave is what, in addition to all the duties and the great privileges and and the work that a preacher must do with a local congregation, uh, what else do you intend to do to spread the gospel in your area, in your county? What reach out methods and, and plans do you have? And they usually answer that satisfactorily. And then we say, okay, suppose you're doing a great job with the local church in a, in a small town, even in the county. You're reaching out by radio or you're going in the jails or whatever your method is. What are you going to do about the whole world? What's going to be your role in world evangelism? Some have a feel, you know, you do your good work, I'll do my good work, and, and gradually it'll all come together like throwing stones in a pond. It's called the, uh, the, the rock and, and, and puddle theory. Um, and so as the rocks fall, the circles wide and wide, and finally they meet. It looks beautiful on paper. It simply doesn't work. And Paul was able to stay at a place 18 months at three years like Ephesus, and, but yet at the same time he wrote letters to many other places. He traveled to many other places. He prayed about them. He sent messengers. And so it, you can, some people say, spread yourself too thin, have too many interests, and be a jack of uh, all trades and a master of none and all that kind of philosophy. I understand that danger. But at the same time, you also can concentrate and do a very splendid work in one particular area and yet have an interest and make a contribution uh, to other works in some way. And I hope that every elder and every gospel preacher that studies the book of Acts will realize that's really the, the scriptural approach and that's the, what a leadership ought to drive for, and that's exactly what's happening here. They preached the gospel. And at Lystra there sat a certain man impotent in his feet, a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Now here is again the very similarity between uh, Peter and Paul's work. You remember uh, there was the sermon on uh, Solomon's porch where the lame man was healed after Peter's first sermon. And then here's Paul's first sermon after, after it. Uh, we have a man healed that's been lame from his mother's womb, just like the man that Peter healed. That, that man was over more than uh, 40 years of age. The same heard Paul speaking, who fastened his eyes upon him and seen that he had faith to be made whole. That is, this man believed that Paul could heal him. This is not a matter of man just being healed because he believed in Jesus. But he had faith that Jesus, through the power of Paul, could heal him. Now, Paul could heal people and raise people from the dead that didn't have any faith in him. This is not saying this is a qualification like some modern-day so-called divine healers uh, say when they fail. They say, well, he didn't have enough faith. Paul could heal him with or without. Luke just records the fact that here's a case where a man did have faith. He had the faith that Paul could make him whole. Said with a, and Paul said to him with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. 
And he leaped up and walked. I've already pointed out that's kind of a double miracle. Uh, the fact that he, after many years, uh, had the ability and strength, the muscles and the bone, to walk is one miracle. And then the fact that he had the equilibrium, that he had the balance and the know-how, and could leap and, and walk immediately is even a second type miracle. And when the multitude saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice, saying in the speech of the Lyconia, in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, and they call Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. Here's a case where again we have Barnabas mentioned first, but we're saying we're in the middle of a transition now where Paul will be the leader and general will be mentioned first. And the priest of Jupiter, whose temple was before the city, brought oxen. And I think the literal word there is uh, really bull, uh, bulls. He brought uh, oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, and we've already mentioned now that the word apostle can be a uh, uh, word of general meaning or very specific meaning. Here it's used uh, both ways because Paul was an apostle eyewitness of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle on the road to Damascus according to Acts 9, 22 and Acts 26, but uh, those three chapters. But Barnabas was also called by the Holy Spirit and sent out or commissioned, uh, charged with a duty by the church at Antioch in the Holy Spirit. So he was an apostle of a kind also, but it was not the same kind of apostleship. It may well be. Someone said, well, Barnabas no doubt heard the Great Commission. And maybe he saw Jesus and heard Jesus say that. Well, so did many others, or they became aware of it because he said, command whatever I've commanded you. So indirectly, everybody would become apostles. It would not make Barnabas an apostle because he happened to hear the Great Commission, or even if he was uh, commissioned to do part of that. Uh, you have to read and we go back and watch the first few tapes. Remember, we dealt with what qualifies a man to be an apostle or an apostle's replacement and looking at Revelation, uh, the second chapter, and, and Acts 1 and some other passages to really fully understand that. But he is an apostle of a kind. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their garments and sprang forth among the multitude, crying out, saying, and the renting the garments is a sign of, of, of deep disturbance and grief and regret and remorse. Uh, it's not uh, just a, you know, a tear coming out of the corner of the eye when some person's a little bit sad and it, it represents great emotional strong feeling and I believe this is the last mention of this in the New Testament but it was their way of showing a inner feeling and uh, they they do this they spring forth and they say sirs why do you do these things we also are men of like passions with you that is we're human beings we're not heavenly creatures we're not gods like you said and bring you good tidings that you should turn from these vain things, the kind of things you think we are, and these material things, unto a living God who made the heaven and the earth uh, and the sea and all that in them is. Why would this be this, uh, why was it such a dramatic response? Why did they react so strongly? Well, you remember what happened just uh, back in chapter 12 when Herod accepted, even though he didn't claim to be, when he accepted the glory that should be given only to God, he was eaten of worms because he didn't try to correct the people. Well, you can rest assured, first of all, because Paul and Barnabas loved God and they wanted God to have the glory and honor that was due him, that would be their main positive motivation. But you can be assured that they had heard and knew about this other episode and they had no desire to be eaten of worms or in any other way punished for taking glory that should only belong to God. And may we be reminded, as we were earlier again, that we should be extremely cautious about accepting titles or descriptions or names uh, because we're involved in religious work and are preachers, evangelists, that would rightly only be used of God. And so they, uh, they had a right to feel this way. And we're going to see a chapter or two later another man uh, that, that had this same uh, experience. Uh, heaven and earth and the sea and all that them that is who in the generations gone by suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. And yet he left not himself without witness. That is, even though the Gentiles, and God let them go, he didn't drive them away. He tried to hold to them, but God's Spirit would not always suffer with man. And uh, Romans 1 and 2 chapter explained this very clearly, 
but after a while, they just insisted, and so God just let them go the way they wanted to go. But even then, he was not happy and was not completely silent. He did not give them the, the 39 books of the Old Testament. He didn't raise up for them prophets because they rejected them anyway. Even the Jews did some, but especially the pagan nations would. Uh, he didn't fight their wars for them and help them cross the Red Sea and cause the walls of enemy cities to fall down like Jericho. But nevertheless, uh, they should not have forgotten him. And Paul is pointing, I mean, uh, yes, Peter, uh, Paul is pointing out here something that uh, he's pointing out later in the Roman letter, that uh, creation itself uh, is evidence is a superior being, and they should have uh, remembered that. And yet he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons, filling your hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings scarce restrain they the multitudes from doing sacrifice unto them. They just barely was able to stop what the people were trying to do. Well, Paul reminds them of what James uh, says in his letter. He says, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Uh, in uh, the Romans 1, Paul reminds uh, the people he's writing to that uh, the things that are created uh, give evidence of beauty and design and intelligence should let them know that trees and stones are not God's, but God is an intellectual being. Now, David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, Psalms 19, verse 1. However, one cannot look at the moon and stars and learn how to worship. One cannot look at the, the, the beauties of this earth, the mountains and the snow and the rainbow and the waterfalls and learn the plan of salvation or how to organize the church. Those things must be revealed through the Word of God, but one can look at those things and say there surely must be a loving, intelligent, uh, powerful, supernatural being behind all of these uh, wonders that we see. They, there is a creator for the creator for that which has been created. And that's the, the point that Paul's making to them. And there came Jews thither from Antioch and Iconium. And how angry and, and how, how full of hatred these people must have been um, Antioch was about 130 miles from where Paul is now. And uh, Iconium was about 40 miles. So uh, they had come a long way to follow and to harass and uh, try to stop the preaching the gospel and the work that Paul and Barnabas are doing. So there came Jews thither from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and entered into the city. And on the morrow, he went forth with Barnabas to Derbe. Now, we aren't told um, here how much uh, uh, this was a natural um, uh, reaction of Paul because he was strong and determined. He was a wiry little individual, uh, one that walked a great deal and probably in good physical shape. And whether he just uh, somehow survived this and they just thought he was dead, uh, they not only stoned him, they dragged him, and that would be uh, very brutal. So he's bleeding and bruised. Or whether God uh, intervened in some way, gave him miraculously the strength that uh, he needed. Evidently, he was very near death because they were gathered around him as if in sorrow or mourning, or almost like they're going to have a wake over a dead body. But he rose up and entered the city and then went forth uh, with Barmas to Derby. Uh, this, this is the uh, place where Timothy lived. And no doubt it was on this very trip that uh, Paul baptized Timothy. He usually let somebody else do the baptizing. But he refers uh, time and time again to being Timothy's father in the faith and Timothy being his child or Timothy being his son. And so no doubt Eunice and Lois and Timothy were part of this group standing around um, uh, Paul. Timothy, as he was about to die, they thought he was about to die, uh, in 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, Paul mentions remembering the tears of Timothy, but he doesn't name the occasion. Uh, at this time, Timothy would have been about 15 years of age. And so you can see this young, impressionable young man uh, seeing a hero because of having been taught by grandmother and, and a mother uh, that men of God are heroes. And uh, he would look at Paul in light of what he knew about other great men of God from Old Testament times. And you can see these women and, and Timothy and others standing and hoping he's not dead and, and so saddened by the brutality they've seen, not just the man sick and dying, but a man beaten. And you know, the way people die sometimes affects how we feel about their death. I don't guess there's any way to ever feel good about a, a, a death completely. We miss them, even though sometimes there is a joy at seeing an old saint quietly die and going to their reward. 
but the horror of all this happening. So here is this young man. Timothy did not seem to have some of the problems that some of the other young men and uh, people that have mentioned in the Bible had, where it talks about their temptation, even Barnabas and James and some of the others and Peter, the way they acted. And uh, no doubt this early experience uh, caused Timothy to uh, be very, very determined. He had a great role model in, in the man that taught and baptized him. And uh, this, no doubt, has a lot to do with that bond and that deep love that Paul had especially for Timothy and Titus. So when we get to the mention of Timothy later on, we need to remember this scene. This was his hometown, and, and no doubt he probably was here at this time. Uh, when they had preached the gospel, verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city, that is, to, to Derby, and had made many disciples... They returned to Lystra. Now, some people would say, well, I'm just going to lay low for a while. I, I about died doing it. I better find something else for a while. But uh, Paul uh, survived, went right on to the next city, continued with his work, refused to be discouraged. They preached the gospel of that city, had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and the Antioch. Maybe things had cooled down by then, or maybe they entered very quietly at night. But somehow they, was able, they were able to re uh, Trace their steps. It says confirming the souls of the disciples. Uh, some sometimes uh, some of the translations use the word establish. Uh, we think of establish as initiating and beginning. We say the establishment of the church on Pentecost. But uh, in the Greek, the word that's translated establish means to deeply root or to firm up or to take care of or to continue to edify. It doesn't mean to start. It means simply to uh, make sure. And just as we might plant a plant and uh, as it begins to grow up, we tie ropes around it to get it ready for the winds that are coming, and we're establishing that plant. We are securing it, or like we might prop a wall that's about to fall down. So they're going back, and they're confirming the souls of the disciples, uh, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. Here's another great example for those of us who teach or preach or involved in church work, whether it's seminars or workshops, or whatever, that we ought to have a real, genuine, personal interest in what happens uh, where we study. Not just be a hireling, not just be a professional that's hired to come in to do a job and, and there not be a real personal interest in. Sometimes uh, you can see that happen. Uh, it doesn't happen often. Maybe we ought not even talk about it. It might make us forget the, the great and the majority and the good people that don't let it happen. But occasionally, uh, a man will decide to do mission work and he'll go all over the country putting people on a guilt trip and saying, uh, how can you ignore these people? And and they've been this long without the gospel, and I'll be the first one there. And we should have had somebody over there years ago. And, and they are, you know, they're, the Lord told us to teach everybody and, and just make people feel because they haven't got early involved, something's wrong. And he will go and do his two- or three-year tour, and he comes back home. And then when he comes back home, he, he doesn't uh, write. He doesn't send Bibles or tracts. He doesn't raise any money. He doesn't try to find a replacement. Uh, it, you know, the, he just completely starts doing something else. That not only hurts the mission field, but it makes you wonder why it went in the first place. If it wasn't some kind of sense of duty or guilt or ego trip or whatever, and you wonder why maybe he doesn't play those tapes back to himself of the sermons he preached to the brethren. And he's telling them that you ought to be interested in all these, and even though you're staying over here. Well, if they, are not knowing but very little about that country, maybe hardly having ever heard of it, should have been interested in Bob. What about somebody that's been over and lived among them? How can he possibly forget them? Well, Paul and Barnabas were not that kind. Even in this country, when we hold gospel meetings, uh, I know some preachers that always get the name and address of everybody they eat with while they're on a meeting, and they write and thank them and, and remember their family and, and talk about the food and their children. Uh, they also will keep a list of those that are, that are restored or a place membership or are baptized and write them a letter. Well, that tells me something about those men. They didn't just go there to hold a meeting and draw a paycheck and, and have a glorified vacation or go pheasant hunting and fishing in a new part of the country. But they were there to try to spread the kingdom of God, and that interest continues after they get the paycheck and, you know, go on back home. And let's, let's try to all have the spirit of uh, Paul and of Barnabas in spreading the word of God to other people. So they went back to confirm. They had continued interest. We can usually go back by phone call or letter or on uh, campaigns in some way we can. It says that they taught them, through many tribulations, we must enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is a broad expression. Uh, the whole universe is God's kingdom. 
Sometimes brethren get excited and say, well, maybe we've been too quick to say the kingdom started on the day of Pentecost. And they begin to see some of these other uses of the word and they get all confused. And then first thing you know, you might be teaching something that is reflecting upon the church and making it sound very, very unimportant. Uh, the kingdom we've already studied did begin on the day of Pentecost. The kingdom of God is used in reference to the church. But the word kingdom is used some three or four different ways throughout the Bible. The whole universe is God's kingdom. Uh, all men and animals are, are part of God's uh, creation and, and are subject to him. Uh, there's a special way it's used uh, about the church, and it does begin on the day of Pentecost. But here it's used in a way it's often used to refer to heaven. It's talking about the eternal kingdom of God where we will live forever ever in his presence and uh, it's not just using it in you know all these other ways so uh, he's saying that if we go to heaven uh, we're going to have to stay faithful even during tribulation when tribulation comes let's don't feel like well you know well, why am I a Christian I thought God would protect me I thought everything's supposed to go well for God's children now. and you know why me Lord this type of thing God's not promised that Christians will have a wall built around them and will be kept away from all kind of troubles. We have to suffer sickness and death and disappointment. Sometimes we get extra persecution because we are Christians. But God has promised that we will have the faith and the courage uh, to help us endure where people of the world uh, will be more like Job's wife, you know, curse God and die, and uh, as she advised, but will not endure. So Paul and Barnabas are teaching them and Paul by his own example of this stoning that he'd gone through and so forth. Uh, by example, it's teaching, yes, we may be uh, tribulated, we may be persecuted, but it's by this way that we are, are matured and gotten ready to spend eternity with God and to show that we are worthy of that. We can't earn it, but we can show that our life's in keeping with that. And when they had appointed for them elders in every church, and it's important to notice here that elders is plural, but church is singular. That is, it refers to a group of people, but it's singular in congregation. So when they had pointed elders, plural, in each congregation, we would say, there's no indication anywhere in, in the Bible of a, a church ever having one elder or even of a church with many elders having one elder that was the, the main elder. Brother Keeble, you say, you know, we got elders, then we got the elder. Well, he was really indicating something that he did not approve of, nor does the Bible. Uh, you, we'll go all the way back to chapter 11 and verse 30 and find uh, the mentioning of elders. Uh, someone might say, well, isn't this a, in this a little early for them to have elders? Of course, we don't know exactly how many months have passed by, but let's try to remember something, that even though 1 Timothy 3, 6 in giving the qualification for the elders says that uh, they are not to be novices, that is, they are not to be new converts or young and immature, uh, we, that these people, in each case, you remember, they tried to start teaching in the synagogue. And so if you go into a town, even though part of the town is pagan, and you have their men who have studied the writings of Moses and David, they've studied the prophets, they uh, don't reject it like many Jews did. They're trying to find the Messiah and understand it better. They believe in morality. They believe in family. They believe in the, the ethics of the Ten Commandments. Uh, they believe that Scripture can be inspired and that it ought to be followed. Uh, they're well along the way to being mature Christians. And so when they uh, are baptized into Christ, uh, they begin to worship God in a different way acceptably, no longer on the Sabbath. They change some of those things. But as far as their character and spirituality and devoutness and attitude towards God, very little is lacking. So they have a big head start on others, even some who were not uh, uh, Jews. You have to remember Cornelius. It says even the Jews liked him, that he had a good reputation among the Jews. He was a devout man. He gave alms to the people. He worshiped God. He feared God. He taught his family that way. Well, uh, I would see Cornelius being able to come, become an elder pretty quickly, you see. So this is not uh, real quick. On the other hand, when we use this passage and say, well, I know churches that wait 20 and 25 years, and here's a sign they ought to get them pretty quick. Well, you want to be sure that you keep things parallel. If you're talking about a new congregation in a third world country today or in America or anywhere, and, but it's in a region where the church has been unknown and the Bible has not been emphasized, it's a Muslim background or Hindu background, a Buddhist background or pagan, uh, then it's going to take a lot longer because they don't have that belief in the one God in the Old Testament and so forth. So we have to rightly handle the Word of God and... and uh, take all of it together to keep it in proper perspective. And that's why they were able to have elders. 
but it is a plural, plural, plurality of elders in single congregations. Uh, they appointed for them elders in every church, verse 23, chapter 14, and had prayed with fasting. And there's a continuing of that practice, you see. They commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Uh, they couldn't stay with them and, and father their faith all the way through, but they committed them to God. We need to help people all we can, but also have confidence in them and have confidence in the, the power of God. And we want to be too parental. We want to control too closely. Uh, it's a sign sometimes we either do not have confidence in the Word of God to guide people or we don't have confidence in them to have the intelligence to follow the Word of God. And sometimes we have to commend people to the Lord we don't need to wait until their body's been lowered in the grave to say, we commend this person to thee. But even while they're alive, uh, and, and, and leave to go do other work. And they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Adelai. And thence they sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been committed to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And what a great statement. They had done what they were supposed to have done. They did not always have success. They didn't convert everybody they taught. They had some enemies. They were persecuted. But their job had been to preach the gospel to Jew and to Gentile and to preach it to every creature and to recognize that God's not willing that any should perish, Second Peter 3 and 9. And they had done that. And we need to learn to leave, as Paul says later on, that we plant water and God gives increase. They left the increase to God Almighty. But it must have been a good feeling to know even the places where there had been failure. They had not failed. But people had failed by not accepting the Word of God, like those that were told not to fulfill that prophecy. Uh, they, Knowing that, still they had a good uh, feeling knowing they had fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, not the mission committee, not the deacons, and not the elders, and I'm not saying missionaries shouldn't meet, but they should. Mission committees can save a lot of legwork on part of the elders. I've been on mission committees and been chairman of mission committees, and I'm for them. But there's a time when uh, works all be reported to the entire congregation. Sometimes we keep congregations in the dark and then wonder why the contribution won't go up, why they won't give. Uh, people give generously when they know how the money's being used. And so uh, Paul and Barbara's had an exciting story to tell, and great successes. Uh, sometimes we mail uh, uh, bulletins to churches that are supporting us, and we tell them not, not something we've done great, but something that's happened. The new countries opened up, new congregations established. Hundreds of people will be baptized, and not any of that report will even be published in the boat. I mean, they may tell about painting the new classroom a different color or adding on a room, but here's a great exciting news, and the congregation that's furnishing the money by which they support this missionary or this man uh, teaching at a Bible school or this orphan's home or whatever, uh, they, they know very little about that, aren't told about that. And um, then, then uh, the, they'll say, well, maybe we shouldn't support that work. The congregation's not too excited about that. Well, here's a good way to keep that excitement. To, they called the church together, and they rehearsed all things. Sometimes people say, I don't like these missionary reports. They sound a little bit secular. They talk about the weather. Well, you know why people go to the mission field sometimes come right back home? Because all they thought it was was preaching and baptizing. And it's, it's not, a, you know, they get over and meet the real world, real reality. And we need to know uh, where our missionaries mail their mail and, and where they go to school and church and what it's like to drive on the streets and the kind of people they deal with. I, I've heard some reports that did sound a little too secular and it's like a nature tour. But uh, Luke's whole book of Acts is a report on mission work. And you report it all. Uh, Luke's going to talk about Paul being snake bitten, shipwrecked. He talks about the weather. He talks about politicians. He talks about the whole thing. But he does tell about the baptism. Sometimes we, we don't pay enough attention to the acts of the church work. When they'd come together and gather the church together, they rehearsed all things that God had done with them. God did it. They gave God the credit. And he had opened a door of faith in the Gentiles. Oh, this was great work, but just the beginning. It was just a door. And, and Paul didn't say, boy, look what we've done. He said, you know, God's done it. Even then, it's just a door. A door is open. The greater work is still to be done. And they tarried no little time with the disciples. They stayed there again and did what we would call local work, but kept the interest in mission work. We'll look at the 15th chapter in our next tape. Thank you for your study.